Very good. Let's just do a quick review here of where we're at. Go back to Joshua chapter 1 with me, would you please? Let's notice a few things that we looked at last week. We'll just touch a little bit on Joshua 2, and then we'll pick up here where we're at this morning. Uh, the Bible tells us in the conclusion of the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, that Moses, uh, his life has come, as the Lord would have it, to an end. He was still able and still functioning, but Moses in a sense, stood in the way of the children of Israel entering into the promised land. God had brought them out of Egypt, that first generation. God had brought them not to wander out of Egypt. He had brought them specifically to take them into the land that he had for them. But because of fear, which led to rebellion, they entered not in. And so God passed judgment on them and said that in that generation, they would all pass off. They would be buried in the wilderness. And then the next generation would be allowed to enter in. Through a series of events in Moses' life, it kept Moses from being able to be the one to lead them in. And so now Moses is removed and Joshua is brought on. And we said this last week as we noticed it in the life of Elijah. Good men, great men, powerful men of God go on, but the work of God continues. The work of God continues and the work of God needs to continue. And we noticed in the life of Joshua, we said uh, that there was a new day but the same God and the same purposes and the same promises. And so, friend, until the Lord should call us home, we're to be occupying and to be busy with that which the Lord has called us to. And we're all very significant to the work of God. There is somebody, there is some group, there are some people that the Lord is going to use you to point to Christ, to teach, to lead in some way, and we should all be looking forward to and being prepared for the work of God to continue in our life. And so we see in Joshua chapter 1 that the Lord will come and speak to Joshua. We noticed a few things. There was a call to claim the land. There was a call to have confidence. There was a call to conquer the land and to go forward. And then there were several challenges, and we considered those last Sunday evening. A challenge for readiness, a challenge for responsibility, and then there was an action by the people. They were surrendered, they were submitted, and they were willing to separate themselves to what the Lord had for them. Now you remember that Israel was that family that sprung out of Abraham. They were a family that entered into Egypt through the situation in Joseph's life where his brethren sold him off. And you remember that in a time of famine, his brothers came in not knowing that Joseph was second in command. And yet through all of that, what God had accomplished was that Israel would be preserved in Egypt. And there in Egypt they would be for 400 plus years until the time of their bondage and affliction and their cry became so much that God heard them and as God had promised, He delivered them and He sent Moses to them to lead them out. You remember that God parted the Red Sea for them. Moses stood there and he said to the people of God, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God brought them across on dry ground, not only did God deliver them from a bad place and from bondage, but God delivered them from a bad man by the name of Pharaoh who followed after them and would bring them back into bondage. And God used the Red Sea to come upon his head and to drown him and those that were with him. The Red Sea is a tremendous picture of salvation. It's a picture of what the Lord has done for us, that he has delivered us from bondage and he has delivered us from a bad man. Amen. And we have now passed from death unto life. And many people, they have experienced that. That's what the choir sang about a moment ago. I've never gotten over being saved. Uh, to be saved is to recognize that I'm a sinner under the condemnation of God. To be saved is to recognize that God gave His Son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. He came into this world. He lived a life we could never live. He paid a debt He didn't owe. He died on Calvary. He bore the debt of sin on His body. And from that offering and that payment, that sacrifice there is now available to all who would come to Him believing, turning to Christ and believing that He is the Lamb of God, that He died for their sins, that He rose to give them life. When we by faith receive Him, the expression in the scripture that is used is saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To be saved means to be in right standing with God. It means that positionally when God sees me, he no longer sees my sins, he no longer sees my past, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is how I'm able to have good standing with God. We do not have good standing with God in our own righteousness and in our own merit. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. The only way that I can stand before God 
blameless and guiltless and holy and innocent is to have on my record the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this is what the book of Romans establishes us in, to have this understanding of what it means to be saved. And this morning, if you've never come to Jesus Christ, if you've never trusted Him, if you've never recognized why He came and why He lived and why He died, and that He lives again for you, if you've never placed your faith in Him, we want to help you with that. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what establishes us. That's what gets us going. And that is all of Him and not of me. And I'm thankful for that today. And so that Red Sea was a deliverance from bondage and a deliverance from that Pharaoh who would seek to put the people in bondage. And then God brought them out. But God brought them out to bring them in. God didn't save you just for you to spend the rest of your life living for yourself. God didn't save you for you to spend the rest of your life bringing glory to yourself. God didn't save you just so that you could wander, just so that you could have fire insurance. God saved you so that you could be used by Him to bring glory to Him and to have fellowship with Him. God restored your relationship to Him through the Lord Jesus Christ that you would grow and develop in that. And that's a tremendous picture of what we call the promised land or crossing over Jordan. You see, the Jordan River needed to be parted as well, but it's different than the Red Sea. The Red Sea was God parting and them walking over. There's going to be some things that will be a little bit different here in recognition and understanding of what the Lord is doing. But the picture there that God wants for us is that He wants to lead us on, and that's Christ that leads us on. He wants us to learn how to pray, and He wants to answer our prayers. He wants us to get into His Word, and He wants us to grow and to be developed in His Word that we can teach other people as well. He wants us to learn joy and to experience joy and the fruit of joy, but not just that, but the fullness of joy. God wants your life to be full. I have a glass here, and every week they faithfully provide that and fill it with water. And I'm thankful for that. I don't know where they get the water, but it sure is good. The Lord doesn't want your life to be half full or half empty, depending on how you look at it. He wants your life to look like this. Overflowing. Why? When my life is overflowing, those that are around me get what? They get wet. They're better for it. My cup runneth over with joy. The Lord wants our life to be a life that overflows. You remember the instruction that was given in the gospel about the Holy Ghost being like a river that was flowing out of their bellies. And what is that a picture of? It's a type of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer being not just a getting by life, but being a life that is bountiful, being a life that is blessed, being a life that is fruitful. And I don't have time to establish it, but success and wet notes and don't make for good sermons. Hold up. There we go. I got my own Jordan River here on the pulpit. That'll work. I hope I can part it. Well, I lost my notes. Let's dismiss. We should do that more often, shouldn't we? Anyhow. It's a type. It's a picture of what the Lord wants to do in your life. The Lord doesn't want your marriage just to get by. The Lord wants you to grow in your marriage. He wants you to experience that overflowing marriage. He wants your opportunity in your relationships with others to be overflowing relationships. I'm not speaking to you of a prosperity that the world speaks of, although I believe that God does cause His people to prosper. But sometimes definition of success and definition of prosperity are different. A lot of that is simply based on your circumstances. If you were starving to death today, if somebody dropped a loaf of bread off, you'd say, thank God for a loaf of bread. And yet there are some folks, your cabinets are so full, I could put bread out in the lobby and you would say, I'm sorry, I don't need it. You see, success and prosperity is relative. But when we speak of success and prosperity in God's economy, we're all in the same shape. And we all have the same needs. The problem is we don't always see that. We don't always understand how broke we really are. We don't always understand how much we need Him. Remember that church that was given those very specific directions in the book of Revelation? He said, well, I, I, I wish that you knew your real temperature. I wish that you knew what you really needed. I wish that you knew how blind you were, that you had asked for salve for your eyes. I wish you knew how naked you are, that you would ask for garments. But we all come before the Lord in need today of 
developing and having developed in our life an understanding of crossing the Jordan, going further. It's more than just being a churchgoer. It's knowing and experiencing in our life God working. If I ask you today, have you had your prayers answered? Do you pray and do you see God work that way? If I ask you today, are you winning souls? Are you fruitful in the business of, of getting the gospel and propagating the gospel? If I ask you today, are your relationships with others, are they, are they experiencing in you and from you an overflowing life? Do they see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life? This is what we're talking about, and so much more could be said there in regards to that. And so Moses now, and this generation has passed off the scene. Joshua has been given instructions by the Lord. He'll send two spies into Jericho. And I'm not belabor it because it's really not the thrust of the series, but when they get into Jericho, they encounter someone by the name of Rahab, and Rahab is a harlot, and Rahab's no, home is known for that. Rahab will receive those two Hebrew men in as spies, and she will cover for them, and she will protect them. And she will do something. A harlot living in a wicked city has more sense than the people around her. Because she will say, we know of God's testimony in your life. We know how God parted the Red Sea and brought you through. And remember, that was 40 years before. We know what the Lord has been doing with you. And now we know that the Lord is bringing you in. And she said, I want you to know that your God is not just the God in heaven, but he's the God in the earth. She made a profession of God. And God, who is merciful, and God, who is gracious, in a wicked city that would end up being a city that God would destroy, God, in that city, spared, perhaps in their eyes, the least likely person. And not only was Rahab spared, but in her testimony, her family was spared also. And of course, you know the end of the story. That Rahab not only was spared the destruction of Jericho that day, but because she professed faith in God, she became a part of the people of God. And she became, according to the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, a part. Wow. What a gracious God. And Rahab would spare those men and they would go back and we see that in Joshua 2. And then in Joshua 3, we see that they've now journeyed from where we left off in chapter 1. And they've moved up and they're up against the Jordan River now. The Jordan River is an, an interesting natural resource. And I use that word natural on purpose. Because it's something that they would be very versed in and they would have understanding of. The Jordan River of today is still in the same spot, but it's a little bit different today because of what's happened in the development around the Jordan River. They've taken from it and they've branched off to be able to get water in various places. But the Jordan River had three sources up north. And they came primarily from the snow that would melt in a couple of mountain regions. When that snow would melt, it would come down and it would hit those three tributaries and it would flow then through the Jordan River. There's not one portion of the Jordan River in Israel that is above sea level. It's low. And so that water would flow in, that snow that would melt, and at times the Jordan River would become very wide, and it would become very deep, and as rivers do when they flood, it would become raging. It flows from the north to the south, and it will flow through the Sea of Galilee, and then it will enter out, come out of the Sea of Galilee and continue on. 150 miles long it is, uh, and all the curving and everything that takes place with it, until it empties into the Dead Sea. You've heard of the Dead Sea before. The Dead Sea is dead because there's nothing able to live there. 30% of it, salt. The Dead Sea is where water goes to die because there's no release of it. The Jordan River at times would be, could be seemingly calm and narrow in certain locations. But where they're at and the season that they're in, this natural, natural river is raging. And God says, I'm going to bring you across the Jordan into what I have for you. Joshua will, according to Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1, notice this statement, and Joshua rose early in the morning. Could I put this plug in there? It's good for us to rise early in the morning. It's good for us to start our day considering the Lord. Now some folks wake up quicker and easier than others. I don't wake up in the morning. My wife wakes up. And man, it's almost like she does a backflip out of bed. 
she's up and she's on the go and she's on the move. That's not me. Every morning of my life, it's as if Jesus is saying, Todd, come forth. It's resurrection time, brother. My eyes are stuck together. My hair is standing straight and tall. My breath can be seen. And I wake up, and I wake up in the morning, I don't want to hear singing. I don't want to hear talking. I want to smell coffee. And I make my way, my journey down those stairs to the coffee pot. And it's on, and it was on this morning, or the pods are set out there for me to get that first cup of coffee. You've heard it before. It's the book of Todd, chapter 3 and verse 1. The best part of waking up. (laughs) Finish it is what? Folgers in your cup. That's right. Man, I get that coffee in me, and I wake up a little bit. My wife, she likes to chirp and talk in the morning, and this morning she was, she's not in, she came to the 9 o'clock service today, she's chirping and talking, and I'm, She's doing that, and I'm doing this. It takes me a little while to get on going. Maybe it takes you a little while. How many of you resurrect every day? How many of you bounce out, and you're ready to go? I hate you, (laughs) but I love my wife. Whether you wake up easy or you wake up difficult, hey, it ought to be in the heart of every person. Say, thank you, Lord for another day. There are people here today they'd like to have one more day on this earth with somebody. Husband, you get up every day and you go and you see your wife and you tell her that you love her. Wife, you tell them you love them. You got children living under your roof? You go in there and you say good morning to them. You plant a kiss on their brow and you be thankful that they're still at home with you. I'll tell you, there'll come a day and they'll have their own roof and you won't be able to go in and see them. You start every day appreciating God for who he is and the blessings of that day. You wake up, you've got party parts that are working. Sometimes they're only working at half speed. But you stop and you say, thank you, God. You got up and you came to church today. I have voicemails from people who called me and said, Preacher, I'm sorry I won't be able to come to church today. My health is such that I can't. I can't put a shoe on my foot because of problems and health issues. Preacher, I'd love to be in church today, but find out this week I've got cancer. And physically I cannot come today. Hey, listen, you're gonna, I'm going to give you some other stuff today, but this is good right here. Joshua got up early. You get up early and you thank God for who he is and what he's done in your life. You want to have a good start to your day? Start it with the Lord. Maybe you don't have time to sit down and read five chapters of the Bible, but boy, you just start thinking about him and how good he is, and maybe while you're going through the process of getting ready, you stop. Hey, young person, listen to your preacher now. You thank God that your daddy and your mommy are there. There are other people who don't have a daddy and mommy there. You thank God for that grandparent or whoever it is that God's brought into your life. You be thankful for them every day. Be thankful for that health. Be thankful for the opportunities that you have. I stood at a basketball game the other day, and as they should do, they played the national anthem, and we paused for a moment. I can't help it, man. Every time that happens, I can't help but think, this is basketball, and in the grand scheme of things, really not that important. It's enjoyable. Glad to get to do it. Appreciate the character building. It's a game. There'll come a day we won't be able to do it anymore. Kids will grow up and they won't go. But we have these opportunities because of our God and because of the freedoms that we have to be able to come into a gymnasium, to have such luxury in our life, to have facilities like this that we have to be able to play games and to be able to have that little bit of a moment there of enjoyment and fun. Boy, be thankful. Be thankful for those in your life. Be thankful for the Lord. You want to have a good week? Start your week out in the Lord's house. You know, Sunday's the first day of the week. A lot of times it gets tacked onto the end, you know, because Monday, Monday's not the first day of the week. This is the first day. It's called, it's the Lord's Day. We start the week out in here. That's why we ought to be here. There's nothing more important going on the Lord's Day than the Lord's work. There's no ball game. There's no television show. There's no activity. There's nothing more important than being in the Lord's house on the Lord's Day. You want to get a good start? You start it in the Lord's house. You start it the Lord's way. We well, you want to have a good start in life, young person? Get up early and seek the Lord. Seek the Lord early in life. 
Oh, be careful you don't lean to your own understanding. Let the Lord help you because there's so many voices that attract us and at times distract us to purposes. But seek the Lord early. Joshua got up early. The Lord's doing something. He commands the officers. Here's the next thing that Joshua needed in order to help God's people. And boy, what a tremendous picture this is. It's a picture of God's people with the spiritual leadership trying to follow spiritual instructions leading the people of God in the right way to go further. You know what makes a great local New Testament church? God's people following the Spirit of God to accomplish the purposes of God. And how many assemblies become a place of quarreling and fussing and it's unnecessary. We're called to a purpose. We're a body. We're a body to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. We're a body that's supposed to shine light in our community. And so oftentimes if we're not careful, we don't follow the leadership of the Lord. We don't follow the leadership that the Lord brings into our lives. And we miss out on that. This is more than Joshua. This is more than the officers. This is the work of God. That's how Moses could pass off the scene and the work could continue on. And that's what God told Joshua. As I was with Moses... So I will be with thee. It's never been about Moses. It's about me being with Moses. And friend, when we have the Lord on our side, we looked at those verses last week, who can oppose us? And so the officers very quickly will go through and they'll tell all the people, listen, it's time to move forward. We're going to go towards the Jordan. And when we get towards the Jordan, you're going to see God work. And man, when God works, it's going to be something to see. And you be ready for that. And Joshua will tell the people to sanctify themselves. I want you to hear, and and hopefully you'll be able to follow me, and I hope that you'll learn something here with me today. But I want you to notice the structure that they were given. Look at verse 3. These are the officers who went through the host. Now, the host, Israel is 12 tribes, right? It's one big family now that's become a nation. Years have passed, 400 years in Egypt, and now 40 years in in the wilderness wandering. Some people project Israel to be as many as two and a half to three million people. Think about that for a moment. So oftentimes in my mind, I read these stories and I think like everybody knows Joshua and everybody, no. Everybody knows of him, they don't know him. Think about two and a half to three million people. If you argue with that number, make it it a half a million. Do you know what it takes to organize a luncheon for a hundred (laughs) people? Baptist people? Where's the salt? Where's the pepper? Um... I don't mean to complain, but is there any butter for my roll? Uh, Do you have any unsweet tea? Help us, man. Now, don't be going in there griping now in a little bit because the preacher's done talked about it, right? Now, we want to accommodate you. By the ladies, they've been over backwards to take care of that sort of stuff. So you have a good lunch in there. But there's a lot of thought that goes into that. Right, ladies? You made that fine meal, and he came home, and he said, oh, Okay, yeah. Fellas, you worked hard and you did something and they look, hmm, is that, that's what it's supposed to look like? Is that what it's supposed to look like? What kind of question is that? Now listen, that's just a little bit of what we deal with. Imagine the pressure that would be on an organization where you're dragging two million potentially plus people who, by the way, are also related. Right? I mean, everybody, somebody's cousin in that bunch. And you know and I know what happens at family get-togethers. Everybody's got a crazy aunt and a crazy uncle. Think about that crazy relative now. That one that you're always worried. What are they going to do when they show up? What are they going to say? And before you know it, man, one group's over here, one group's over there. We're leaving, they're going, here you go. And you say, well, is, aren't family get-togethers wonderful, Right? So here they are, right? But here on this day, man, they are moving forward. They want to see what God has for them. They've got good organization, good structure, and they're given a pattern here of what they're to do. Now, how had God led them thus far? God had used a pillar of fire, and God had used a cloud, hadn't he? So there's going to be a little different structure here now, even in what God is doing. There's something else. Remember that God had told them they were going to get in, and the manna that God had fed them with every day was going to come to an end, and they were going to eat the fruit of the promised land. That that manna was going to dry up. So there's things that are going on in their life that are new for them. They're different for them. God brings them to this point and 
the direction is to this host. We see that term through the host. Tell everybody, but this is a massive group of people. It's a massive group of people that aren't just going to fit through a section. You know, they're not walking across a path like this. They're making a dent, man. They're moving wide, and they're coming through. But they're all, look at this, they're all told to follow the same thing. It doesn't matter how many people are in the host. It matters what's leading the host. They're all told that when they see the ark, they're to stay a great distance off. But when the ark moves out in front of them, that's what they're to look to, and that's what they're to follow. I want to point out two things here to you very quickly. Look at verse 3. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. Boy, we've got to pause for a moment and talk about the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, right? God, after he delivered them out of Egypt with Moses, he established with them a means through which God would come and dwell with them. God came and dwelt with Israel. He dwelt in something that was called the tabernacle. The tabernacle, according to the book of Hebrews, is a picture of things that are in heaven. This tabernacle was a structure. It had an outer courtyard that was surrounded by a a fence, if you will, made from material covering different boards and things that would protect it 15 feet high. The dimensions were specific. Everything about it was specific. If you'd walked into this fenced-in area, you would have first come to a great big altar, a bloody altar where sacrifices were offered. If you'd moved past that, you would have come to a laver, a wash basin. The Bible never gives us the dimensions. It speaks of the materials. Some of the materials were looking glasses, things that were given to the people when they left Egypt. I suspect that if you had looked in the labor, this is my thoughts, when you looked in the labor, you would see your reflection. People were commanded to wash themselves from the defilement of the world. Then if you'd walked through that courtyard, you would have seen that altar, that labor, and then you would come to a building. That building was the actual tabernacle. Inside of that tabernacle, there were two rooms. The first room that you would enter into is called the holy place. In the holy place, there was a candlestick. In the holy place, there was a table of showbread. In the holy place, there was an altar of incense. Incense making a sweet fragrance to the Lord. The bread showing who the Lord is, that He's the bread, He's the supplier, He is the source. The candle, the Holy Spirit, the light and the enlightenment. On the other side, there was another room divided off, a very special place called the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies rested the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box made out of wood covered with gold. The Ark of the Covenant was to be carried. The Ark of the Covenant was special because of what was inside of it. The law was placed inside of it. Later on in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, we find out that not only was the law there, but there was also manna, and there was also Aaron's rod that budded placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. On top of this box, to somewhat like the size of that Lord's Supper table down there, pretty close to that. On the top of that was something called the mercy seat. The mercy seat was made out of gold. The mercy seat was shaped in such a way that there were two angels, cherubims, mighty angels, the host of heaven. They were looking like this with their wings pointed out and their wings were touching and they were looking down on the mercy seat. On the mercy seat on Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, the high priest, only one person allowed to go in, would go in and he would sprinkle blood on that. That blood on the mercy seat. Mercy covered something. It covered the law. The picture there is that from God's perspective, God looked upon His people in mercy because of the blood applied because they did not follow the law. The law, a violation of God's commands. When the Lord Jesus died and His blood then was taken and placed on the mercy seat in heaven. And when that mercy seat in heaven received that blood, God looked upon that, the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus, and something happened at the temple. The tabernacle was the movable structure. The temple is what Solomon built. The temple had a holy of holies as well. And when the Lord died on Calvary, the Bible says that the veil, the curtain that surrounded the Ark of the Covenant in the temple was torn from top to bottom so that all people could approach and could come in because now the presence of God was available to all people because of the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. You see, there's a distinct difference in what these people are being told to do. They're being told to stay back 
If we figure out cubits, they're being told to stay back a thousand yards. They're being told to stay way back and watch the ark go forward. They're told to be in awe of God, as we should be in awe of God. But then I hear the words of Jesus. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you understand something? Now I'll have to wrap this up. But a world that does not recognize how awesome God is will never appreciate the Lamb of God. Because when you see God for who He is, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, eternal, without beginning, without end, without a creator. God needs no creator. He is the creator. When you see God, the living and true God for who He is, you and I would fall on our face and tremble at the very thought of God. The prophets, as they approached God, they trembled and they were fearful. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, as one preacher said. How the nation should tremble today before God. When we place upon our currency, and we have as a part of our national creed, in God we trust. Understand and recognize how big that God is. We as a nation should be governed and directed and be in awe of the God who is the one and only God. When we lose that fear and that reverence of God, then the mediator who brings us to that God, what's the value? I'll give you an example. When two people are at odds with each other, and there is a desire for there to be connection, the one who is able to mediate that is a person of importance. I have had people, for, for sake of illustration, I've had people who've called me and said, Pastor, would you please talk to my wife? Would you please talk to my husband? Would you please try to get them on the phone and see what you can do to help straighten this thing out? Would you please call them? Would you please talk to them? Pastor, would you call my child? Would you communicate with my child? Would you sit down? Would you talk to them? Because there's a problem and I don't want you to help with that. And who am I? It just happens to be in that situation that because of relationship and connection, there's that hope that maybe I could speak some truth into something that somebody maybe through connection and relationship would listen to and be able to help. But there are, with that, people who could absolutely, positively care less what I say. What do you get him involved for? What's he going to do? I take that on a much bigger scale. God high and lifted up, who sits on his throne. The earth is his footstool. The universe is the span of his arm, who holds the waters of the world in the hollows of his hand. Listen, bud, don't mess with that God. You better know that that God, when he says he has eternal judgment planned and there is a, a, a lake of fire, a place of judgment and suffering, when he says he'll turn the nations into hell, you ought to quake and we ought to be still. Oh man, how the people in Washington, D.C. ought to fall on their face tomorrow before they start anything out and say, oh God of heaven, we've sinned against thee. How the people of God ought to recognize that. You see, the bigger the God, the more you recognize who he is, the sweeter the Savior. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's not so amazing when God is brought down here. We have cheapened God. Began with Cain when he left the presence of the Lord and he began to worship creation more than the creator. It has swept our culture through the textbook that teaches that there is no God and that people evolved. That tears down the very foundations and the fabric of who we are, a people who believe in the living, true God. He said, when that ark comes, you get way, way back. I'll give you two things in passing and then we'll move forward. It doesn't matter one way or the other if you agree with me on this, but I think I'm probably right. 
it seems to me that there's a difference here in how the ark is being carried. It's being carried the same way, but by whom it's being carried. There was a group of the Levites. The Levites were the tribe who were given the work of God. Now listen, every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. A priest was the one who had that specific responsibility to do specific things, offer sacrifices and be involved in that. Others of the tribes of Levites, and I'll not give you all the names, but they're there. Their responsibility was to pack things up. Their responsibility was to move things along. And so as a people, Israel, if it was time for them to pick up the tabernacle, there were those who had set responsibilities God had given to them. You go, you pack things up. There was one group, they folded up all the material, and they carried it. They had carts. Two of the groups of people had carts. They could move everything on carts. But certain things that of special value had to be carried. The ark was one of those things. It couldn't be put in an ark, or a cart rather. It had to be carried. You remember later on in the life of David where they began to carry the ark in a cart and it began to stumble. The oxen began to stumble and the ark began to fall out. So people reached out and they touched it and they were judged because they hadn't followed God's protocol. The lesson there is this. God has a specific way that he wants things done. Do it his way. Do it his way. He's merciful and gracious even at times when we don't. But friend, when you, God gives you enlightenment and you know what His expectations are, when you see His directives, follow them. Amen. In this instance, it seems like, as is the case later in Joshua and then in the book of Kings with Solomon, it seems like specifically the Lord is trying to tell us that the Levites or the priests carried the ark. Generally speaking, when the ark was being carried and moved from place to place, it would have been covered up. I think, and again, I'll not argue the point with you, but I think perhaps the ark at this point was uncovered. And the people who were carrying it were the priests. Because God wanted those there to know, at the very least, that what was happening there was not of man. It was all of God. And yet, God said, when you see the ark, you stay a great distance away. And when you see it move, that's how you follow all of you. Everybody following the same thing. The ark spoke of what? It spoke of the mercy seat. It spoke of the presence of God. Why was God able to live with his people? Because of the mercy seat. Because of the blood applied. Why do you have the presence of God in your life? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Why does Hebrews tell us to come boldly to the throne of grace? I'm not uh, uh, you know, 10 football fields away. I'm right up on the Lord. And I'm told to come to him because of the mercy seat. Because Christ is that blood applied. And they're off at a distance, and God said, when you see the ark move, and you see the presence of God move, you all follow. And they did. And the Lord said, I'm going to do something. When those priests step into the water, I'm going to cause the Jordan. Remember now, natural. The natural man looks at that and says, how in the world are they going to get across the Jordan? Are they going to build a bridge? Are they going to build rafts? If I'm on the other side of Jordan, I'm looking at the Jordan River, I'm thinking to myself, naturally speaking, this is like the least likely time for anybody to cross here. Naturally, this is the time of year where the water's raging, the water's deep, and the water is wide. Surely it'll be a while before they get across. But God picks a very opportune moment to show something. What does he show? That he can defy. He can defy what you and I think restricts him or keeps him bound up. And you're looking today at a new year. It'll be here before you know it. And you're looking at your life. You're looking back at your life in Christ. And you're looking forward to what the Lord is doing in your life. And you're saying, man, preacher, I believe as that cup illustration was given, there's more I want to get back to that. I've experienced that fullness. I've experienced that overflowing in my life, but I just don't know how. There's, some, there's a hurt. There's a problem. There's a sin. There's an issue, an undealt with issue. I just don't see it, preacher. Man, I, I want my marriage to be that, but I've got bitterness in my heart. I want my relationships with others. I want to be used in ministry. I just don't see how it can happen. That's the natural. The Lord says, I'm going to do something. But notice this about the Jordan crossing. The Lord said, I want the priest to carry the presence, the Ark of the Covenant, and I want him to step down in it. 
And when they step down in it, I'm going to heat the water up. We're almost through. Look with me very quickly, would you please? Notice with me, beginning Joshua chapter 3. And look at verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take ye twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above. And they shall stand upon and what? Heap. It came to pass when the people were removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. That the waters which came down from above stood and rose upon an heap very far from the city Adam. That is besides Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. When the people, when the priests stepped in, God said, when their feet step into the brim of that, and they do what? What was the word? Rest. Now, I don't know about you. Resting sometimes is difficult. Resting speaks of trusting. Resting speaks of being firm in my position. So when those priests step in and they rest there in the brim, I'm going to do something. I'm going to cause that water. And he takes it back. And God gives you a description here of what he did, where the water started. He put up in a heap. I don't know everything about that. When we get to heaven and we have replays, this may be one of those that I'd like to see. And he stops that water here and there so that the people of God can cross over. We'll read tonight in chapter 4 what happens specifically. But the Lord does something what? He does something very unnatural in the midst of the natural. And he expects the people of God to do what? Follow. And what were the priests directed to do? Get in the water. Get your feet wet. You see, salvation, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But now we're talking about going to the promised land. We're going in the same way we're going in through Jesus. Jesus is the ark, and we'll touch on that tonight. But the Lord's expecting something of us. What's he expecting of us? By what? Faith. That was faith. They heard the word. God gave the command. But now God was saying the faith will be evidenced in your obedience that you will do what? Step out. In this business of a prayer life, God wants you to do something. He wants you to step out. In a matter of witnessing, God wants you to do something. He wants you to step out. What's stepping out looking like? Maybe today stepping out in prayers to go home and rather than sitting down and watching the ball game, maybe you go off into your room and you make a list of people or situations in your life and in your heart that are going on and you begin to pray over those things and you have confidence and you believe that God can answer you in that. Maybe today it's to go and to, on your way out of the door, grab yourself some gospel tracts. When you get to the gas pump today, you get to the restaurant today, giving that gospel tract to somebody and said, hey, let me start with this by asking you to read this. Who knows that in all areas where the Lord is dealing with you, but he wants you to do something. Maybe in relationships are not as they should be, and maybe what needs to be said is, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I forgive you, I love you, I want things to be as the Lord wants them to be. What is that? Stepping out. Maybe in the matter of giving, when you look over your finances, and say, man, they are an absolute disaster, they're an absolute mess. Perhaps you've not followed the principles in the scripture and taken God at his word that God wants you to honor him first. I could go on and on. But here's my conclusion for this morning. Get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. Follow the Lord. Follow his word. Follow his commands. Follow his presence. And step out. And get your feet wet. When they did, what happened? Things began to go on around them. All of God, who parted the Jordan? Have you ever put your foot in water? Did your foot go in the water do anything other than contaminate the water? Who was it that parted the Jordan? It was God that parted the Jordan. But what was God looking for, moving them in? Obey me. Step by faith. Where one generation failed in this, you follow my word. And you step out. You rest in my word. You find hope. You find confidence in my word. And I'll do amazing things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God, the instruction that we receive. Help us, Lord, to step out.